In the harrowing depths of history, unspeakable atrocities unfolded within the sinister confines of slave breeding farms. So what twisted methods of punishment were employed in these establishments? In this video, we will talk about the most horrifying punishments inflicted upon those trapped in the clutches of the slave breeding system. So let's get started. In the past, enslaved individuals in America had a tough life working on plantations. They were closely watched by overseers who could be either coldly professional or brutally violent. Trust among slaves was broken as they competed for a favor, often becoming overseers themselves at the expense of their peers. While the Western world rejected the slave trade, America created an internal market for slaves, treating them as commodities. This deprived them of autonomy, bodies, children, youth, and futures, a painful truth that history struggles to confront. But before we go any further, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. During the time of slavery, the breeding farms represent the darkest and most troubling part of its history. As the world started to recognize the cruelty and inhumanity of slavery and wrestle with its moral and economic consequences, the United States faced a harsh reality. By 1820, there were approximately 1.5 million enslaved individuals who played a crucial role in the nation's economy. The production and export of tobacco, cotton, rice, and sugar, all produced through the labors of enslaved people, drove the growth and prosperity of the United States. Despite the international outcry against the slave trade, the country couldn't change its course. So, plantation owners came up with a chilling solution. They began breeding their own slaves. This internal market ensured the continued strength of the economy in the antebellum period. The number of enslaved people, which was initially around 1.5 million, grew to an astonishing 4 million in just four decades. It was called slave breeding. Large farms were created in Maryland and Virginia to produce more enslaved people. This was done to make sure there was a constant supply of enslaved individuals for the Deep South. But how did this terrible practice come to be? At that time, there were legal complications in the United States that allowed internal slave breeding to happen. While people like William Wilberforce and Christian groups were fighting to end slavery in the British Parliament, a significant moment came in 1807. The Slave Trade Act was passed which effectively put an end to the Atlantic slave trade. This was a big step towards stopping the horrible treatment of enslaved people. However, in the United States, there was a different situation. The country was experiencing a big expansion in farming. The invention of the cotton gin made cotton production increase dramatically, and the nation was constantly growing its territories to the west. The cultivation of sugar, cane, and rice also continued to grow. Even though there was a growing international pressure and calls to end the slave trade, the United States was at a critical point in deciding what to do. On January 1, 1808, a significant U.S. law banned importing enslaved people from Africa, following the British's lead. However, the U.S. adopted a cruel system called natural increase to sustain their agricultural workforce. Enslaved individuals suffered greatly on plantations, losing their dignity and humanity. It's crucial to acknowledge that experiences varied based on various factors. Enslaved individuals had to work long and hard in the fields from sunrise to sunset six days a week. They often didn't get enough to eat, and what they did get was often not enough to keep them properly nourished. It was especially tough for those who were enslaved on smaller farms that were struggling to survive. They often went hungry. The living conditions for plantation slaves was very basic and offered little comfort or relief from their hard lives. Within the boundaries of a plantation, it was rare to find anything beyond a dirt floor with no furniture. Violence was a constant threat for many enslaved people, often inflicted by the overseer. The overseers and drivers played a crucial role in maintaining the hierarchy between the slave owners and the enslaved individuals. On larger plantations, overseers were especially important, and their presence gave rise to numerous horrifying stories from the time before the Civil War. The main job of overseers was to ensure that the enslaved individuals worked as hard as possible in the fields, and their pay depended on achieving high levels of productivity. In their quest for maximum output, overseers resorted to almost any means they considered necessary. This led to their infamous reputation for being heartless and cruel. They were often described as being drunk and prone to violent outbursts against those they were in charge of. While many accounts confirm this dark reality, the truth is a bit more complicated. The overseers found themselves trapped in an impossible role, burdened by overwhelming demands. They were part of an oppressive system that forced them to act in ways that were harmful to the enslaved individuals. Although this doesn't excuse their actions, it highlights the complexities of their position within the plantation system. 
The masters or landowners of the plantations had a strong desire to maximize their profits and maintain a workforce that appeared content. But how was this possible? How could a group of enslaved individuals who endured backbreaking labor and were deprived of enough food to survive ever find contentment? How could they be motivated to work harder when they were denied their freedom and sense of self? The overseers themselves varied in their abilities and personalities, representing a diverse range of people. Some were the sons of plantation owners who wanted to take charge and eventually establish their own plantations. Others were semi-professional managers driven by similar ambitions, making up the largest group of overseers. And then there were those who were downtrodden and desperate, using their position to exert cruelty and violence. Regardless of the overseer's background, it was rare for them to stay in their role for more than a few years. Ironically, even in a system that systematically dehumanized individuals, there was a limit to the cruelty that could be endured. In the eyes of the plantation owners, enslaved people were not seen as fellow human beings, but as valuable possessions. If an overseer treated the laborers too cruelly, they could be quickly fired by the owner. However, in the complex system of slavery, the role of drivers added a disturbing twist. A driver had the same responsibilities as an overseer, but there was one horrifying difference. They themselves were enslaved. Yes, this unsettling truth is real. Masters on antebellum plantations in the United States often chose a slave from among their own group and gave them authority over their fellow slaves. This created a deeply troubling situation within the master-slave relationship. On one hand, a master might promise better treatment to a driver in exchange for making the other enslaved workers more productive. However, being favored by the master did not necessarily make the other slaves trust the driver. The tasks and responsibilities given to a driver were unimaginable and required exceptional skill. It's still a puzzle how a driver managed to maintain the respect of their fellow slaves while trying to please the master. It has been documented that drivers were often disliked by their fellow slaves. However, paradoxically, records also show that drivers were more popular and stayed in their roles longer compared to overseers. Despite the seemingly impossible nature of their job, drivers were able to manage plantations more effectively than overseers. It is important to note that this doesn't mean that the other slaves didn't resent the driver, but, ma but masters preferred the competence of a driver over the unpredictable overseers and enslaved individuals began to trust that one of their own could make their circumstances somewhat less harsh. In the narratives of enslaved people from the time before the Civil War, we find clear accounts that reveal the brutality and horrifying reality of forced mating. Assault, rape, and coerced relationships were common, often carried out by slave masters, their sons, and sometimes overseers. Disturbingly, there was a deliberate increase in arranged marriages and forced breeding with the goal of expanding the slave population. Edward Franklin Fraser, a well-known author, accurately described slaves as being treated like livestock, including controlling their mating practices. In the stories of enslaved people like Maggie Stenhouse, a disturbing practice called stockmen emerges during the time of slavery. These were enslaved men who were treated like animals, being evaluated and tested before being put in rooms with women that plantation owners wanted to have children. The plantation owners started to view their enslaved people as if they were livestock, and some men were chosen specifically for breeding purposes, while women were treated as mere breeders. The role of a breeder took away the control that enslaved women had over their own bodies. They were forced into sexual encounters and not allowed to refuse, all so that more enslaved children would be produced in the future. The conditions under which this happened were horrifying. Enslaved women were selected during their breeding period, often when they were very young. Some accounts mentioned 22-year-old women who had already given birth to seven children, or 19-year-old women with four children. Their lives were reduced to enduring rape, going through pregnancies in extreme poverty, giving birth in fields, and then being expected to become pregnant again within just two to three months. They were stripped of their bodies, separated from their children, and had their lives taken away from them. The breeding women of the antebellum period faced unimaginable indignities that our history books rarely dare to discuss. With that said, thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more. See you in the next video. Till then, take care.